world-class ice climber Will Gadd is back to Kilimanjaro. Over one century, scientists estimate that 90% of the ice on Kili disappear. What will be left after six years? It's shocking. The last ascent, Will Gadd's return to Kilimanjaro. Hello and welcome to our YouTube live chat with Will Gadd. This is essentially about The Last Ascent, the film that Will's just completed, all about how ice climbing informs the world of climate science. It's a very, very poignant topic at the moment. Uh, if you've never come across Will Gadd before, let me give you a little introduction. He's uh, synonymous with the world of ice climbing. He's won every accolade and trophy available in the sport. But to describe him purely as, a, as an ice climber, is to do him a disservice. Will is a passionate outdoorsman. He's uh, an accomplished kayaker, mountaineer. Uh, he's into caving. He's done Nordic and Alpine skiing. He's into mountain biking. He's broken his own world distance record for paragliding twice. Uh, he's essentially an adventure sport polymath whose talent will succeed no matter what he applies himself to. Uh, he's also a great conversationalist, so I'm looking forward to the next hour immensely. We're going to run through some of the key scenes from The Last Ascent, the movie that he's about to release, and talk about how the expedition unfolded. All of the drama, uh, all of the action, and of course, all of the science. So, without further ado, let's introduce the man himself and bring him on screen. Will, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Oh, Ed, thank you so much for that kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I know it's the middle of the night for you, and yet you're all fired up. And uh, yeah, great to be here with you. And thank you, everybody who's tuned in, dropped in, whatever you do to a YouTube chat. And uh, looking forward to answering your questions and having a good time for the next, what, 45 minutes is what we're in for? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, awesome. um, where are you at the moment? What have you been up to? So I am in Canmore, Alberta in the Canadian Rockies, and uh, it's kind of, you know, everywhere else in the world fall just started, but it's already late fall here, the leaves are turning, we're looking for ice climbs, you know, it's, uh, it's almost winter, so um, yeah, looking forward to getting out and swinging ice tools again. Okay, um, let, let's go to the start of the last ascent. You'd done this trip in 2014. Six years later, in early 2020, you decide to return. Why? A couple of different reasons. I wanted to see what had happened with the ice, what had changed in six years. Um, you know, where I live, climate change is, is having a big impact on ice climbs, and all over the world it does. But on Kilimanjaro, it's such a, a, a relatively unique place. It's ice on in Africa, you know. <laughs> so to go back there, see how it's changed, and also have a look at this thing called the Messner route, which is something I've always wanted to climb. And uh, yeah, document the changes. And then the kind of a third goal in it all was to help a really great guy named Douglas Hardy. He's a professor and has done climate research on Kilimanjaro for a few decades and help him out. So three big goals and also just curiosity. What's changed? It's been six years. It's not that long, really. Can't have changed that much. Well, uh, the biggest element of this expedition, though, has to be the altitude in terms of preparation. How, how does it change? how you prepare for an expedition when you've got, what were you up at, like 19,000 feet, 6,000 meters? Yeah, it's really high. You know, ice climbing is hard at, at sort of normal altitudes, but you, it's like trying to ice climb with a bag over your head, you know, it's, it's so hard. And there's, unfortunately, you can prepare, you can be physically strong, you can, you know, be, you know, I, I train very hard for all of my trips and, and train hard most of the time in life. I'm, I'm pretty fired up on that, but you can't train for altitude. You just have to show up and suffer until you acclimate. And it's one thing to climb to that altitude and then go down quickly, tag a summit and you're out. But we were up there for a week. And honestly, it's, um, I don't recommend the experience. It's, it's like, imagine being really hungover. Can we say that? I don't know what we can say here, but yeah, it's like being really hungover. And then somebody asks you to go for a run. It's pretty much the last thing you really want to do, but, um, it's the coolest ice in some ways in the world. So you, you motivate and you got to remember too, it's not just me like, um, that's getting slammed by the altitude. The whole team is just getting pounded. And, you know, maybe I don't really feel like 
getting out of bed and going ice climbing. But when the camera guy gets up, you get up. And it was just a great team that was so motivated despite being sick and hammered and just, yeah, it was, it's a good team. It's interesting. I remember reading about Uli Steck saying that when he started speed climbing at really high altitudes, he said, the less time you spend up there, the safer you are. And but <laughs> you didn't have that luxury. You had a long period of time, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, we were on top of Kilimanjaro for a week. And so we can't just zap up there and then zap down. And for anybody who's climbed out of that, that altitude, tag the summit, imagine like you don't go down, then you just hang out there. And over time, you, and if you spend enough time to get there, then altitude isn't that bad. And um, Uli was a, a good friend of mine. I, I love the guy. Uh, but he has a special ability to suffer that unfortunately I don't have at the same level. So it's, all of us were just getting destroyed up there. But it's, it, we had to spend the time up there to, to do Doug's research, to do the climbing we wanted to do, and recreate the pictures from Pondella. So I think we'll get into all of those topics. But we, we really needed a week up there to, to get going. Okay, um, you mentioned that there were three objectives before. That must have expanded the size of the crew as well. How, how big was the crew that you took up there? Well, that's a really good question because the crew uh, was very large. A lot of what I do is, is relatively small crews. It's, it's my climbing partner and me, or maybe a stills photographer video. It's, it's pretty small, honestly. And on this one, we had a great crew from Keo Films, really great people. So we had six or seven people um, that were doing various jobs there, plus Christian, plus my climbing partner, Sarah. But how it works on Kilimanjaro is you have to take um, local people with you. That's their, their way of, uh, of being engaged. And it's, and it's awesome. It makes the trip 10 times better to have them involved. But it's not a light process. This is not fast and light alpinism. This is very slow and very large alpinism, <laughs> and, it's, uh, and, it's, and it's just great. So I think we had something, we had well over 100 um, people carrying various bits of gear, and um, it's the, by no. far the largest. Oh, yeah, it was, wait till you see the film. The, the opening scene, it looks like something, you know, you could just see, and the stoke is high. Everybody's so fired up, because for them, this is great work. And I just think it's, you know, that the Tanzanians are, are just... As they're just fired up to do um, cool things, and, and uh, that was one of the best parts of the trip um, for me. And I think we'll show maybe show a clip of them ice climbing later. But it was, yeah, it was just great. But it is a big event for sure. It's not, it's not slow. You you go, and there's a lot of other people there, and um, it's an adventure. And we're, it's also a lot to manage. Um, you mentioned earlier on though that one of the main objectives was going to have a look at the Messner route on the Kilimanjaro Glacier yeah. up there. Um, and um, we've got a clip now that we can show where you went to go and meet Reinhold Messner to go and find out about the route and do a little bit of digging uh, ahead of the mission. Uh, let's take a look at it now because for me, this is a lovely scene where essentially you're meeting one of your heroes. Every climber's career has an arc and mine started in roughly the same year that Reinhold Messner did this route. Messner, for those of you who don't know, is one of the most iconic mountaineering figures in the world. I'm talking about the guy who did the first solo ascent of Everest, who did the first time Everest without oxygen, did all the 8,000 meter peaks without oxygen. Yes, sorry. And for me as a kid, he was in the stratosphere. I would never have anything to do with something that Messner had done. This, this route is so important to him that he put it on the cover of his book. All the things he did in his life, and he put this route on the cover, and you can see why. It's like, if you're an ice climber and you look at that, you're like, yep, that is the real deal. The big challenge of Messner's route of Kilimanjaro's breach wall is a 90 meter tall icicle that he describes as like the spire of a church. A few months ago, I was lucky enough to meet the man himself. How old you are now? 52. 52? Yeah. I'm very good too. Still in good shape. And you too? Yeah. <laughs> I asked him what, 40 years on, he could remember of the route. And the icicle was really huge on the, on the base. In the inner side, we had water. And it was possible to climb it partly with gloves. On, on big holes and partly with ice axes, but it was the most risky thing I ever did. 
He did this route in 1978 and set standards for an era. This is not a Himalayan peak. This is a wild ice climb. And it's also at 18,000 feet, 5,000 and some meters high. Since Messner, only one other expedition has succeeded in climbing it, Scott Fisher and Wes Krause in 1984. To be here and climb that route, that is in some ways a culmination of my own career. And bigger than that, the climate is changing. Quite literally, right now could be the last year anybody will ever climb this. Will, when Reinhold Messner says to you that a climb is one of the most intimidating and challenging climbs he's ever had, that can't fill you with confidence. <laughs> no, I think when somebody like Reinhold Messner, you know, first person to climb Everest without oxygen, first person to climb all the 8,000 meter peaks, all 14 of them without oxygen, go to both poles and really set the standard in, in so many different forms of climbing and doing so many things that are by any measure, you know, he, he would be the first to say very, very dangerous. And when he says this route is the most dangerous thing he ever did, yeah, it kind of gives you some pause, doesn't it? But uh, yeah, to, to meet him and, and talk with him was, was just great. You know, he really is one of my heroes and he set the bar for everything in the mountains. And that bar is still well above where a lot of us are playing today, you know, even, even 40 years later or something. He's, just an amazing person and that climb was so important to him you could see the fire in his eyes when he's talking about it he's up there like sticking his his wool gloves on the thing right <laughs> i guess his hairball <laughs> yeah, this is madness and to do that in the era he did it and as a climber you look at his gear and it's like somebody showing up for like a you know to, to race an indie car race or something with like a go-kart you're like no this is junk dude don't do that and he made it happen so super super impressive to to see honestly like i'm uh yeah i was a highlight of my life just to interview the guy and then to hear about the climb did not really inspire me with confidence but it is a lot later and i've done a lot of climbing you know ice climbing has advanced in terms of gear and knowledge and um but yeah, when Reinhold Messner says it's crazy and, and dangerous, then it kind of slows you down. It's, uh, I mean, for me, there was, a, there was a lovely moment in there that I love that you've left in the film. There's that when you, when you first meet there, you kind of size each other up and it's, it's quintessentially climbers sort of looking at your <laughs> physiques and going, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure exactly how old he is, but he's still in fantastic shape he looks like he's younger than me you know the guy's got this big beard and he's just you know in the game and, and a very dominant personality in a room but you could tell that he's used to being in charge of situations and uh just that intensity of purpose is very clear in everything he did in his career and in person and uh yeah i gotta say it did not fill me with confidence when he when he described the rocks falling and everything it, it definitely um, I'm not going to say it shook me, but when your hero tells you that something is really dangerous and a bad idea, it's a good idea to ponder whether you want to go forward or not. Had you, had you seen that route in 2014? Yeah, I saw it in two, four, 2014. It was giant. It was a big blue cylinder up there. But at the same time, the glaciers that feed it are shrinking quite quickly. So as those glaciers disappear, then the ice route will disappear. So I wanted to go back before those glaciers were too small to really feed the ice route. And uh, yeah, well, you have to watch the film to see what happens, but it, it's a, it's changing so quickly there. You know, when Messner was there, there were glaciers all the way around the top of Kilimanjaro, giant glaciers, and now that's just not the case. Okay, I mean, from your perspective, he's definitely up there as, as one of your true heroes in climbing at least. Were, were there nerves going to meet him? Because that, it's always a danger, isn't it, going to meet one of your heroes? Well, yeah. I mean, this guy is famous for chewing on, on journalists. He's very smart, very quick, and has a very low tolerance for, uh, um, you know, horse byproduct, right? Like, he's, he's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, uh, you meet the guy, and, and you're always like, is he going to call me out? You know, is Ryan Old Mester going to be like, ah, you are not ready, go home, you know? But he was really, he was actually quite positive, and he's just a genuine human, and he understands the mountains. You know, he, he really does understand how they work and how people who go there work. And so we ended up having this 
was supposed to be a 15 minute conversation and 45 minutes later we're still talking about the mountains and all the other journalists lined up to beat him or, or give me the evil eye <laughs> you know, like, but it was it was great it was uh, just a wonderful conversation and, and uh, yeah a hero and a, and a gentleman it's interesting you say that i, I mean as a climbing lay person i have this perception of these almost gatekeepers of climbing culture mm. who police and fiercely guard against sort of light claims and um, pretenders to the crown. And, and Reinhold's one of those, isn't he? So, and you mentioned it, you, you said he sort of, you, there's that fear instilled in you that, oh, am I doing it right? Yeah. Well, and I think you'll see in the film too, we had, a, we had some options to approach that route in different tactics. And we chose to approach it in a very pure climbing perspective. Um, I was, you know, of all the routes in the world to revise the original style in, that is not the route to do it on. <laughs> so, you know, I would be haunted by, a master would show up at my house with an ice axe, or fair enough, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's this could not happen. So we, we, we very much were cognizant not only of, the, of trying to do it, and I think that's important in climbing. You don't do things in a worse style, you know, Messner climbed Everest without oxygen. I think if you're going to climb Everest, you should at least equal the bar of somebody that did it, you know, many, many decades earlier. But um, so I wasn't going to lower the bar on that route um, in any way and certainly felt the, the historical significance of it. And to Messner personally, too, it's, it's just respect as well. I think you have to respect people and Messner has earned that respect. 100%. Um, now, uh, yeah. if you're watching us live, please, uh, we're going to put all of your questions to Will at the end of the show. So if you've got anything you want to ask, if there's any topics that you want to go into a little bit deeper, then you will have your chance at the end of the show. So uh, chuck your comments in, we'll sift through the best of them and we'll put those to Will uh, at the end. Right now though, we're going to take a look at another clip and almost as soon as Will, Sarah, Christian and Douglas Hardy arrived, uh, in their base camp, they were struck down by altitude sickness. It's, as Will said earlier on, a terrible affliction and it's completely random. Uh, this is how it affected them. But more concerning is that the altitude is starting to take its toll. How's it going? Oh, it's okay. Unfortunately, Sarah is really not feeling well, so we're going to contour back over toward camp. Find a chill for a bit. Let's get back to camp so easy. before you so get good. worse. If you just have basic mountain sickness, it, it can get bad. I'm with you. Let's go. I don't, I don't want to go right now. Okay, just but I, I, want, I want to get back over there before you get worse. So let's, we got to go, okay? Sorry. Mountain sickness from the low pressure and a lack of oxygen is extremely dangerous. Symptoms like Sarah's can progress rapidly and become fatal. The only option is to get back to camp and rest. The view can wait till tomorrow. How'd last night go? Well, my best night. I think I got a little sick. I had to get up and throw up in all night. It wasn't so wonderful. I think I feel a bit better today. Let me translate that. She had a really horrible night. I could barely walk back and then threw up in the middle of the night and it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I watched scene. that. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, I just watched that. It brings back those memories. So many, uh, you know, the ideal way to acclimate it to climb is you have a long time and you very slowly go higher, but it's it's very hard to do that in Kilimanjaro. You've got to you've got to move quickly up there. Just the structure of the system there, so you end up much higher than you should be, much faster, and then you suffer. And uh, that's that's. I just look at Sarah that seed. She suffered so hard, and uh, we all did. But she she got chewed on extra hard, and yeah. But she got up the next morning, and we went and and went out and did things and uh just <laughs> when I look at that all oh, it's tough and oh. that little exchange there when she sat on the rock and you're trying to get her moving any couple would recognize it as a sort of 
diplomatically we can say a debate but for me (laughs) there's sort of the partnership that you've got there as as um personal partners but then there's the role as climbers and that seems to override the personal relationship and her safety becomes paramount yeah i mean it's it's always a balancing because sarah and i are partners in life as well as climbing partners a lot of the time and um, or partners in life always climbing partners a lot of the time. I should clarify that. But the uh, the she's um she's super tough. She doesn't complain. She's she's very very hard. But in that situation, it, it is really serious. We we have to get a little bit lower, get back down to where our camp is, and and be ready if 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 complications do you know start happening. And altitude sickness is. It's common, everybody gets it, and usually you can work through it, but if it does proceed to, you know, the big ones are, are high-altitude pulmonary edema in your lungs, where your lungs start filling with fluid, or high-altitude cerebral edema, where your head starts filling with fluid. So either one of those two things needs to be responded to quite quickly. And we're also looking at the crew, you know, we've got the Tanzanians there, and, and most of them are, are much better acclimated than we are, um, but they're, they're, some of them are not, so we're trying to monitor that as well. And and the film crew and it's it's a it's a real enemy and again you can't you can't train for this you know maybe if you if you ran around your house with a plastic bag over your head you could you could train for it but you have to go to altitude you know and, and this is not a good idea don't do that and somebody out there is like aha I have the new system don't don't do that but, but um, Sarah <laughs> thank you, you know, for clarifying that. Well, I, I, I've always worried that, you know, there's something random will come out of one of these things. Be like, oh, he, he shed a tray. Don't do that. So anyhow, you, you have to just show up and suffer. And Sarah's doing that. And, you know, it's part of high altitude life. You get you get through it. But it's it's never any fun. And again, the closest thing is just to have a bad hangover and then go exercise. You know, if it's that's the closest physiological and psychological imitation of it. You feel kind of nauseous. You don't want to do anything. You just want to lie in bed and watch, you know bad series of uh, netflix or something <laughs> but, yeah, big hazard up there and but it's as i understand it, it's completely random it's like a slot machine any one of you could have uh been affected yeah it, it is totally random and, and some years i do really well at altitude and other years i don't actually t- traditionally i don't do well at altitude at first i adapt well over time but when i first get there my oxygen saturation is really low and i feel horrible but fortunately i do adapt quickly usually but, you know, I've had friends who've summited Everest without oxygen and then gotten sick at much, much lower altitudes. So it, it is pretty random. And, you know, just it's just a credit to Sarah and how tough she is that she just would, you know, spend a, have a absolutely horrible night and then get up in the morning and be like, right, what are we doing? <laughs> it's just tough. It's, it's fascinating talking to you now with a bit of distance between it because watching the film, it, it feels quite dramatic and one of the questions I'd put down was how close did you get to pulling the pin but you've sort of you've you've soothed my concerns there it feels like it was something much smaller now yeah it was serious at the time but that is the thing you have to treat it seriously because if it does start going bad you know the the only the only real thing you can do um that that has a long-term effect is get lower you could put somebody in oxygen temporarily, you can do different things, but physiologically you have to get lower. So Sarah was about as low as I would let that curve get without doing, you know, dropping down to a lot lower altitude fast. She was very sick. That's that's acute mountain sickness at that point. And and honestly, if it had have gotten any worse, if there were if she started to get any less physically coordinated or any of the other cerebral edema things, we we would have gone down. So that's about as sick as I've seen somebody in the mountains and and hung in there and not not descended several thousand feet immediately okay um you mentioned that there were uh three main objectives up there um and we we've already seen reinhold messner the the first one on your shopping list it felt like was the messner route and we've got a clip that we can take a look at now uh that shows you getting up there for the first time and taking a look at this route and it's it's the most poignant part of the film for me, I think. We can take a look at that now. That, that's it up there. Oh, come on, be in. So you've got to get a feel for the face. You've got to look where the rock fall is. You've got to look where the snow is and see how things speak together. It's like a giant puzzle. 
At last, I've got a clear view of the route. It is so different than it was when we were here in 2014. It's, it's completely different. Hey, can we get those photos from you, brother? It's not like it was when we were here. Do you remember the big pillar that was, was out from a, the wall? It was a beautiful column, the whole thing. Yeah, so where's the beautiful column? It's not a freaking pillar anymore. I mean, it was like a solid pillar column. This one, from lower down, you can... Yeah, that's way out from the wall, and all that's left are the junk show remnants in there. Well, <laughs> let's, let's look at it through the 600 and zoom in. I change the zoom around on it. Yeah. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of dark coloring up there, and that dark coloring means there's a lot of rock fall. You can't argue with a rock. <laughs> No deep wisdom there, but you get you scared. You get hit in the head with a rock, it's a bad day. You you looked upbeat at the end there. Your humor's there, but was there must have been a deep underlying frustration at what you were seeing. Yeah, I mean we traveled halfway around the world to do a route that it, it, it's iconic and it's not there. That's it, big chunks of it are missing and I'm a mixed climber it maybe would have been possible to put bolts in and and climb those missing sections on the rock but that's again that's not very good style nor is it what I wanted to do I wanted to climb the ice before it was gone and I have pictures of that from decades and there's icicle there's always a big blue icicle there and then now I get there and it's gone and it's it was you know, it's it's just you know, in climbing, you always want to do the first ascent, right? And I'd hope that maybe there is still enough time and to bring some attention to how things are changing by going and doing the last ascent and putting some focus that we're losing things, that there is real change here. And then, you know, so that's the idea a little bit, but then you show up and you're like, yeah, it's too late. It's gone. And it's, it's a little bit confusing in those photographs because you can see how much white is up there. And if that were all glacier, there would be a giant glacier still feeding that thing, but it's not. It's mostly snow. And even in the snowiest season in 50 years, and we know this from Doug's research, and we'll get into that a little bit later, um, that snow is not enough. You really need that glacial ice to feed this feature and, and to have it um, grow. So the glaciers are not feeding the icicle, and it's gone. It's missing those little chunks up there, they just look like tiny little chunks, but that's a giant feature. So you, you couldn't just sort of swing around them and, and avoid the rock bits. And then I don't think it was attached to the wall very well at all. We found ice at similar altitudes and it was just kind of stacked on the wall and, and it, it was, it, you would, yeah. It, you can't climb that even safely. And then the finally the last danger, sorry to go on about this, but I'm getting all emotional no, I'm looking no. at it. I'm like, I'm thinking about it, I'm there. So, um, but the, the last thing is when you have um, a place where a glacier was, it's kind of a giant bowl up there. And when you have that bowl, all the rocks that used to be in the glacier or have moved around that are now on the snow, they fall off as that melts. So you, you have huge areas of unstable rocks up there and you can really see the streaks in the snow underneath the climbs. And, you know, maybe it's defensible to go in there by yourself and solo it if that's what your mission is in life and you feel it's worth your life. But I certainly couldn't take or go in there with another person. You know, I, I again, going back to Sarah, that was, I wasn't going to go in there myself. Like, I don't want to get, you know, the, the, the object is to have a good time, not, not a... Uh, and a long time. <laughs> I don't want to last, so I, I don't want to go to a place with a lot of rock fall that's missing most of the climb. And you know, I'm very, yeah, you can see the film. I'm trying to be upbeat. It, it is, it, you just can't argue with the mountains. They are the way they are. And if you try to argue with the mountains, you're going to get hit in the head with a rock really fast. So it's time to leave. And I run away a lot. Unfortunately, in the mountains, probably half the time I go to do something, I run away. It just doesn't work. And generally but films just show the success. That's the age old saying in the mountains. The bravest thing to do sometimes is to turn around and say, not today. It's, it's the hardest thing to do. And you can feel that in the moment. But it's yeah. how you, 
when you've it's one thing to do that when you've gone up you've maybe driven up the hill you're having a look and then you can drive home but when you've climbed up to five and a half thousand meters eighteen thousand feet to, to make that call it must have been heartbreaking yeah it was it was really um painful to make that call but you know i've been at this a long time and you just can't argue with what is in the mountains you can't let your ego dictate what you do if it's not good conditions then it's just not and you can you know we tried again we like hiked up there and tried to commit for the side and we, we did everything we thought we could reasonably to to gain knowledge and understanding but at some point you do have to even if it's technically possible even if you're like yes i could do this um it, it's not worth getting killed for and i think the odds of getting um killed there were really high it's a uh it's not the right place to to go and then also to do it in a style that messenger would haunt me with his ice axe yeah <laughs> no way so <laughs> and if you're putting bolts into a route that master climbed in the in, in the in, you know 40 years ago you have not really um risen to the occasion have you so a few things there don't want to be haunted by the ghost of messner don't want to turn into a ghost i'm out you know let's, let's go do something else this turns it into this starts to bring us towards the climate science as well because you in 2014 you go to that spot you look at the messner route and it's this giant beautiful column of ice that's yeah. obviously climbable and then six years later on one of the biggest snow years that kilimanjaro seen so that column should be in season it's it's changed completely that six years is an evolutionary or a climate blink of an eye it's so so short yeah. I mean, that, that's quite a, a scary prospect, seeing that kind of decay in that period of time. Yeah, I th and I think that's what I hope people who watch the film can see. You know, it's, we think about climate change as being a relatively small blip, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's giant when you can see the differences so quickly. And um, I, I don't want to beat people about it. That's not my job in life. I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an athlete. But if I hope I can show people and get them thinking about things a little bit and just see it in a different perspective. It is really shocking. And for me, it has had a, you know, I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's, it's had a big change in my life and how I look at the world. And, and you know, it's, I, I think also it's really worth putting in this conversation. I don't want to run it on too long, but the, you know, if I'm an ice climber and I can't go ice climbing, it really isn't, um, it's, it's not going to change the world, right? Like, let's face it, the world does not need ice climbers. <laughs> so I, I, I have, you know, I, that's just the truth. But for the Tanzanians who rely on the moisture that feeds the glaciers of Kilimanjaro, it is a really big problem. And so I, I, I can complain a little bit about not being able to do my sport, but I think it's an indicator of a much bigger problem for the people who live there and, and globally. That's really the story that um, is, is in some ways more, well, in all ways, a lot more important than mine. It's a, uh, you know, so I, I just want to keep that in there and recognize I don't, I don't want to be the climbing, like, I can't climb my ice, but this is a much bigger problem. Yeah, it, it's your, your uh, a method to highlight these issues. And yeah. well, this brings us really nicely onto Douglas Hardy, who you mentioned earlier. He's a, uh, tropical glacier scientist, so excuse the pun, but a man with a shrinking field of expertise. <laughs> and uh, you, I mean, you took him up there uh, to go and take his measurements on the ice. And there, there's a lovely scene now where we get to see where you've gone up to his weather station of 20 years to find out exactly what's going on up there. Doug's automated weather station collects data on snow depth, temperature, humidity, and solar radiation. Modern technology is great, but man, you leave him for two and a half years. Yeah. That's a long time. Can you so, remember the key? That's my only question. <laughs> <laughs> In the 20 years it's been here, the surface level of the ice has fallen five oh, meters, oh, yeah, 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 according yeah, yeah. to Doug's station. Cool. So the big question here yeah. is, why is the ice on Kilimanjaro disappearing? It really seems that the ice is suffering here for changes in humidity in the atmosphere. So for lack of clouds and more clear sky, so that there's more energy received at the surface, which is causing the, the lowering of the glacier. 
So it, in simple terms, it, it's humidity. And then in the broadest sense, in climate change, it, it's really all part of the climate system. Yeah, I hear climate change and I think global warming. This is all about global warming. Yeah. But this isn't really about the temperature rising. It's about the climate changing and then it being drier so the ice here evaporates quicker. Exactly right. And then that takes us to the Indian Ocean, which has just been warming radically for 100 years. That seems to be sort of the root cause of what was happening here. So the whole systems are changing because the Indian Ocean is warming yeah. up. It's wild. It's really wild. Yeah. I just see it. Oh, there goes my icicle. Yeah. But it's a much yeah. bigger thing, isn't it? With Doug's help, I'm beginning to understand that the ice up here is acting as an important marker of how our planet is responding to climate change. Hmm. And how hard was it for you while talking to Doug? Because I imagine he had some pretty scary truths for you. Well, it's, I think understanding is always good. If we understand things and, and learn about them and try to engage with them, that's that's the root like of all good decisions in life. How well do you understand the problem and, and what can you do about it? And with Doug, I actually um, found what he was saying to be a little bit alarming, but more it was understanding. Okay, here's what's happening. And it's a super complicated system. And now I've got a little bit better understanding of how it works and what I could maybe do differently and why. And so knowledge is always good. You, you, you know, bottom line, the more you know, the, 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 the better things work out in, in most systems. And uh, yeah, so I, I just really enjoy learning from Doug and he's put so much of his life. You know, he's, this is not like a big climate conspiracy theory stuff. There's a guy who's suffering at altitude up there to check his, his weather station. You know, like this is not some kind of plot. It's, <laughs> it's just like, you can make a lot more money doing other things in life and not, just, you know, having his brain hurt for a week straight on top of Kilimanjaro. This guy is dedicated and, and really believes in what he's doing and that passion comes through. So it's just, I really, really appreciated his knowledge. And just to point out that, you know, I, I was helping him with his research, research and stuff. He's a very capable guy on, on his own up there. And, and it was just a pleasure to be involved in his project and help him out. And grateful to Red Bull for, to support that. You know, it's, it's uh, without that, he couldn't have done what he did that year. And um, I'm, I and he are appreciative of that. How often is he heading up there? He would like to go up there probably every year. He is a glutton for uh, altitude abuse. You know? <laughs> so I, I think he'd probably, I, he's just so dedicated to his work. I think he would go up there every year, but he can probably, he can only go up there realistically every two or three years. It's, it's hard to get funding and um, it's, what he's doing is very, very important, but it, it is a little more remote. It's Kilimanjaro. It's a long way from maybe the, the places he's seeking funding in North America. Obviously, you'd had a six-year gap between your visits, 2014 to 2020. Um, what was Doug's reaction when you got up there? Because there's, there's small chunks in the film, but what, how did he feel? I imagine you were watching him quite closely when you first got up there. I, I, I really just enjoyed talking to him because his reaction, my reaction is emotional. Like, who stole my ice climb and why are the blocks so much smaller? It's pretty straightforward. His reaction is much deeper. It's like, ah, so the sublimation efforts have been, you know, there's more sublimation, so there's less ice, and is it the same way? And snowiest year in 50 years, but the ice still isn't growing. You know, you, some of the pictures you, you look at, I think we'll show some later, but it looks like there's more ice up there, but there's not. It's just snow. And that ice is not turning into more glacier um, as he hoped it would. So it, it, it's sort of like when you're not a sailor and, and, you know, you're in a storm and you look around and it's like, is the captain worried? Like, if the captain is having kittens, then, you know, put on your life jacket. <laughs> and Doug was definitely concerned because he has the knowledge to understand this. And then he also had some insights that gave me a bit of hope um, for the ice on Kilimanjaro and also for life in general. So he's, he's not a doom and gloom guy. He's just, here's what's going on. And... I think we need to separate those two things. There's, there's politics and then there's science. And he is a scientist. And, and he's, he saw some reasons for hope then. That's interesting. Well, he, he's been studying the ice up there for decades. And one of his theories is it can form much quicker than we maybe had thought in the past. So if we can 
um, cut down on the warming and cut down and increase the amount of precipitation, it could form relatively quickly. It's not going to happen in 10 years or something, but it's, it's maybe not, it could reform quicker than some other glacial systems. The, the, the systems on Kilimanjaro are quite different than your glaciers in the Alps or New Zealand or Canada or the Andes or the Himalaya. Um, it's, it's more about precipitation and, and melt rather than pressure in typical glacier systems. So, and Doug can get very technical. I don't want to mis misquote him here. But there, there's hope. It could form relatively quickly, um, which would be great. And, and I, I have one question that I'd sort of thought about, and I was trying to work out a sensitive way of asking it without may, wanting to make you feel um, silly in any way. But it was that idea that with hind the benefit of hindsight and having had time to process this trip now, whether there was any sense of naivety in what you found there, whether you should have been more prepared. But from what you've said there, it sounds like it was a shock to not just you, but to one of the experts as well. Well, I think it's a shock to anybody that goes up there. Even the even the, the Tanzanians who work there, they 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 notice in their you know between sort of seasons how quickly things are, are changing. You know, we we were able to get them ice climbing and talk to them and show them maps, and they'd be like, "Nope, that glacier's not there anymore. That one's not there. That one's not there. That one's not there." I mean, most of them are already gone up there. It's there used to be just a, this huge ring around Kilimanjaro, so. The, the experts are surprised, even the locals are surprised to go there regularly. And yeah, perhaps it was, I was, I guess I'm just eternally optimistic. I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe it won't have changed that much. You know, I could, then you get up there and yes, it's changed that much. But um, you got to be an optimist in some way to get, get things done. A realist too, but an optimist as well. Okay, you, you mentioned the porters and the local Tanzanians there, which brings us on really nicely to the next clip. Before we go into that, though, I'm just going to give you uh, another little uh, tag down at the bottom there. We're going to put any of your questions, well, the best of your questions to Will at the end of this broadcast. So please uh, just stick your co uh, questions in the comments down below and we'll do our best to answer those at the end of the show. But right now we're going to go back onto the Kilimanjaro Glacier. Um, if you're just joining us, then Will's got a film coming out very shortly called Last Ascent, which looks at uh, the glacier on Kilimanjaro. He went up there with a crew of nearly 100 people. And this little clip that we're going to see now is you taking some of the porters up ice climbing. And it's, this is absolutely brilliant. Amazing experience. Super, super cool to see this go down. These guys are so psyched. You have bad. He's a natural. Put your waist toward the ice like you're making love to it. Yeah. There you go. Good. Now you can stand on your feet more. Just small steps, Ben. Small steps. It's fun. Coming down, but going up was hard. That's your first time ice climbing? Yeah. You did great, man. Really good. Really good job. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> you, you did great. Yeah. It's great. The green New experience. Ice. You know, I'm, I'm a visitor and I've climbed your ice, but now you get to climb your ice. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's cool. Maybe in the future I'm going to learn more. Yeah. People ask, why do you go climbing? <laughs> this is why you go climbing, because it's fun. Adding this flavor, a flavor here, it's a great moment in life. Maybe in the future, who knows? I'm going to try and do this and do it for my plan. <coughs> up here. <coughs> yeah. You can see just how physically demanding that was on the boys, sport climbing at 18,500 feet. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's just great to watch that. And, I'm, and, I, and I'm, I imagine that some of them are also watching this as well. So, Asante Sano to you. Thank you very much to the, to the Tanzanians who made all that happen. And, and that was one of the best days of my ice climbing career. Just awesome. So, um, yeah, big thanks to the, to, the, to the locals who made this happen. We couldn't have done it without them. But, that was, that was honestly one of the best days of my ice climbing career. Just so much fun to share the stoke and, and see them climbing on their ice. And yeah, so good. Really, really wonderful thing. 
Do, do you think it's a, a viable business for them? Is it something that they could set up? I don't think ice climbing on top of Kilimanjaro is probably a great business plan, <laughs> honestly, because it's you're up so high and you're suffering so hard. You know, it's sort of like, would you like to go running with a bag over your head? And no, I think I'll miss that. But uh, it's it, it. I mean, if they took if it, people had time to acclimate, um, that would be. You, you could do it for sure. And just the novelty of climbing ice in Africa. Um, and some of those guys are going through their guiding programs and, and may end up being part of the International Association and um, they could do it. They're, they're super athletic you know, people and they spend their time at altitude and you can see even they're gassed, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, there's some small satisfaction of being like, even the people who live up here are hammered. <laughs> so, but they climbed so well, it was just great. And I mean, looking looking now at the the film as a whole, there's a couple of things that I wanted to discuss. I mean, one of the one of the key elements, and we haven't seen much of him. He showed up very quickly in the uh, clip that we saw about the Messner route. But how important was Christian Pondella's role in the film and, and what he brought? Because he'd been there in 2014, hadn't he? Well, one of, you know, Christian took these photographs in, in 2014, and I think we'll see some of them here, but they just showed these crazy scenes where it looks like icebergs sailing across a, a sea of sand. And each of those icebergs um, really used to be a glacier or, or, a, or a chunk of a much, much larger glacier. And all that was left were these sort of office-sized building pieces of, of ice in, in the sand up there. And that was in 2014. And... So we went back and we recreated a bunch of Christian's photographs. You know, here's where it was in 2014. Stand in the same place, take the picture. Excuse me, here's where it is in 2020. And what's the difference? And it was just massive, huge difference of no matter how you look at it. So having that documentation, I think, is pretty important. But really what's important is because Christian's such a good photographer and, and has a real eye for capturing not just sort of like, here's the thing, but here's what it looks like in a, in a really insightful way. Um, those pictures show people around the world how this is changing. And I think that's really important. And it meant a lot to Christian. You know, his work is having a real impact. And it also meant a lot to me to be part of the project with him and you know, see the guy work. It was really important work. I noticed as well that you were there was a bit of drone use going on as well, wasn't it? Are you incorporating more and more technology into expeditions at the moment? I think it's inescapable, you know, that, that you have more and more technology from the from the amazing guy. You got to go check out the guy who skied down K two and his brother shot it with a with a drone. I mean, that's just crack. Yeah, it's so sick. If you haven't seen it, you got to go check that thing out. It's so cool. So it's probably on Red Bull's channel somewhere. But it allows us to see things in different ways and to understand them in different ways. And I think when used appropriately, drones are great. When one shows up and I'm rock climbing, I'm looking for a rock to throw at it. You know, I hate them. But in this situation, it's appropriate. And we did try to be very um, sensitive to the other people in that environment and not not get the drone in there. And occasionally, you know, as an, as an athlete, I have to say, all right, look, it's not the right place to use a drone. But technology allows us to see these bigger systems from the air and, um, and, I, and I'm all for that. Just we have to use it, you know, responsibly. It's like the Superman quote: "With great power comes great responsibility," or something. <laughs> we just have to use it a bit responsibly and not bluntly be a pain in the ass to other people in the environment. Well, that's what comes through the film. I think is that you're able to explore the ice in great detail, and exactly as you mentioned in the skiing descent of K2, they actually use that drone to rescue someone on the mountain. It's that's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm all for technology and, and you know, and, and to rest, to help bring um, drugs to somebody on the mountain and help them or or map the extent of the ice on Kilimanjaro or some of the other projects I've been involved with in Greenland. Drones are awesome. Technology is great. And it is odd that the thing maybe that is causing a lot of our problems in the world in terms of our changing atmosphere and technology um, could also be helpful to save it. So everything everything has one or six or 25 different sides to look at and just try to use it well and for good, not 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 evil, I guess. <laughs> How it works. Um, well, you mentioned very quickly there, Greenland. Can you tell us a bit, a uh, little bit about that uh, expedition? Yeah, I think we're gonna have a clip somewhere in here of, of Greenland. Is that coming up or you're, you're probably more in yep. tune with that? 
It's yeah. If, if okay, you give so, us a little introduction now, and then I'll I'll, I'll find that one. <laughs> all right. So one of the things that's been super rewarding um, for me as an athlete is to be able to use some of my skills to help people operate in environments that are pretty hazardous. And just to be clear, this is not guiding. I'm never going to run trips down glaciers as <laughs> a guiding project. It's a horrible idea. <laughs> but I'm able to help um, move people around and do research in places that are really difficult, including the top of Kilimanjaro, but also underneath the Greenland ice sheet with Jason Gully, who is an expert on glacial hydrology. So I've done a couple trips to Greenland now where I'm trying to help people understand how the, or just help the project of understanding how meltwater moves through the Greenland ice sheet. You know, we always see these crazy headlines, Greenland ice sheet is, is melting, but what does it actually look like? Where does that water go? How does it work? And that's what Professor Jason Gully was trying to figure out and I was trying to help him help him do that. And he actually got a really good paper that's coming out and going to be published here relatively shortly out of that project. But yeah, I guess the clip's coming up that'll explain that a little bit and just happy to be able to help uh, move things forward. Okay, it is a fascinating proposition. Let's take a look and see what it's like to go under the Greenland uh, ice shelf. This is behind the scenes sports action. Christian Pondella hanging on the rope. We got Jason Gully, professor, feeling a little bit maybe that this is kind of like a bit sideways, but dealing with it well. We got Scott Simper up there on drums, dropping shit down to keep it Western. And we got the star of the show, the big ass Mulan. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's just insane it, it looks like a giant frozen sinkhole yeah that's what you're exactly right it is a giant frozen sinkhole and if you were to go down there when there's water running sometime in a very long time from now you'd show up um at the edge of the greenland ice sheet that thing pumps water underneath the greenland ice sheet lubricates the ice sheet and then it moves toward the uh toward the ocean at various rates depending on how much water is going down there. And that's what Jason's research is, is all about. Um, I haven't actually seen that clip before, so that's pretty great to see that. But uh, um, yeah, great crew in there as well. I, that's one of the things about all these trips. I'm so lucky to do them with the people that I, I do them with. You know, they're just, look at that environment. How do you even, like, you can't pay somebody enough, so you better be a really adventurous, wild person to, to do this. And I'm just very grateful to the teams that I get to do this with. But uh, yeah, that's we're operating in a wild place for sure. That's way out there. It's um, we saw Christian Pondella in there very quickly again, and uh, it's one of the yeah. it's one of the themes that I've seen with all great action and adventure sport athletes. It's it's like the old saying: behind every great man, there's a great woman. I think behind every great action and adventure sports athlete, mm -hmm. there's a great media collector be that a photographer or a filmer and it feels like that relationship you've got with christian has been an integral part of your career yeah i mean christian and i have done more than 20 projects together um over the the past couple of decades so we've we've just been all over the world together doing um things that are difficult and hazardous and in that environment you've really got to be a good team i have to trust that christian will do things that are relatively safe and that he will not do things that endanger me and and then work hard you know on these trips you see the pictures in the movie and but there's a tremendous amount of really hard work you know one of the reasons that i keep doing trips with christian is that he works hard he works hard with his camera and then he's up in the morning making you know sandwiches for the day and we all do that i might be the the athlete or whatever but i'm making sandwiches and i'm washing dishes you know we all work together on these trips and it's it's you know, as you said, maybe there's there's the athlete who's doing the film or whatever, but it does not happen in a vacuum. And we all have to work really hard to lifeguard each other, keep each other safe, and keep the trip moving forward. There's you know, there's no star on these trips. You're just everybody works. If you're not working, you're doing something wrong. And we all work as hard as we can, pretty much all the time on these things. Well, it, it comes through in The Last Ascent, it comes through in all of your films. It's very clear that there's no ego involved for you, which is, I think, one of the most endearing parts of your films. And talking about Christian as well, there's that lovely analogy that in, in the environments you're working in, if he doesn't get the shots, then essentially it didn't happen. Mm. But we, you know, we always do put the, 
you know, the number one goal in, on all these trips is to come home. So we try to make decisions around that goal and remember that goal. And we've had some close calls on these trips. They are dangerous. And, and usually when we go back and look at them, it's like, okay, we lost track of that goal. Christian got focused on getting a shot versus being in the safe location. And he's a professional. He really, really wants that shot. But over time, I've learned that you you just have to keep those top line goals in your head at all times. And that makes decision making um, a lot easier. So, yeah. But he's you got to watch him. He has a certain you know, squirrel tendency. Occasionally there goes the squirrels. But he would say the same about me, you know. Yeah, it's like where Christian go. But he would say that he would say the same about me. And that's where monitoring each other, he'd be like, Do we really want to be doing that? And and Scott Simper the same and I work with many of the same people over and over again and we're we're good friends and we watch out for each other and and know that it's what we're doing is is high hazard and and operate with that always first in our mind. And have fun okay. because you can see in that film we're having fun, right? <laughs> well, you, I tell you what comes through is your eternal optimism. Um, uh, we've, <laughs> we've had more than enough questions from me now, though, uh, so we're going to move it over. We've been asking for your questions in the comments section of this broadcast, and we've got a few of the best ones now. We've got one from David Alfter. Uh, how do you feel knowing you're probably amongst the last people to ice climb on Kilimanjaro given the current climate? Well, it's, how do I feel? Well, I don't feel very good. I hope that everybody would have these, this opportunity, you know, forever. Um, and I hope that people watching this are engaged and, and do see the change and, and maybe want to get involved in whatever way they can. And, um, you know, it's Kilimanjaro is one piece of the much larger puzzle. So we have to be thinking, I think it's important anyhow, to be thinking about this and, and globally. And wherever you live, this is going to have an impact, whether you live in Greenland or a big city. You know, what we, what we see in the big cities is maybe um, less dramatic. But if when I show up in the mountains and my whole, to go to work, I'm a guide as well, so I show up in the mountains and like my whole office building is gone, as it was on Kilimanjaro, then it's a little bit more um, evident. So I, I hope people look at this and it's not just a you know, a blip. I hope people think about it a little bit and, and I'm not slamming people to do things differently. I, again, it's politics and science. They're not the same. And I, ju I just hope people tune into the science and, and make decisions for themselves, really. But I wish everybody I could think... go ice climbing on Doc Kelly. <laughs> but, but that's one of the key things, isn't it? If you, exactly as you say, if you live in a city, your environment just isn't changing. So it's very, very easy to forget that this is affecting the natural world. Yeah, I mean, you don't see it as maybe as I do. As I as I travel around the world, it's it, things are changing really quickly from the Himalaya um, to the to the Alps. You know, many people in Europe right now, you know, the 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 the, the, the train used to stop at the edge of the glacier and, and then the edge of the glacier dropped down. So they built a you know a, a, a cable car to get down to that, and then it dropped lower, and now there's ladders to go down, and pretty soon you're in this. You know, it's, it's dropped hundreds of meters in, in just relatively recent time. So you, you see it. And um, I hope that people can clue into that. And, you know, coal miners used to take canaries into the coal mine. And when the canary fell over, it was time to get out. Well, I'm sort of the canary. My ice climb has fallen over. And it's, you know, maybe we can make some changes. And again, not politicizing this. I just hope people look at it and make their own decisions. Okay, we've got another question here from Samuel uh, Kondratsky. Climate change contributing to glacier retreat is very obvious in Canada's alpine landscapes as well. Perhaps we we'll could go in, uh, could go into what work he's done closer to home. Well, thank you for that. And yeah, I've, um, so it's it's really obvious in my home mountains, and this is where this whole process started. When I was a kid, you'd park the car at my kind of what I would call my local glacier, the Athabasca Glacier, and walk like three minutes, and you're at the glacier. And I was doing a program on climate change up there recently, and we parked the car and you walk for kilometers to get to the glacier. So in my lifetime, that's how dramatically things have also changed in the Canadian Rockies. And I hope by sharing that story and just showing people again, you know, it's, it, it isn't, again, if you work in a big city or something, you turn the air conditioning up if it gets a bit warmer, no problem, right? But I hope by showing people that this what's happening and it's very visual and very real that it again it, it helps people think and yeah i'm doing some work um, on the athabasca glacier near my house 
and hope to do more of that. We're doing some neat, potentially doing a neat project measuring ash deposition and how that, so we've got all these forest fires, they're putting down ash, how does that change how quickly the glaciers melt? So, um, unlimited interesting projects, and, and if I can, again, use my sport to help our knowledge go forward, I, I think that is important for my kids and just my own peace of mind. I don't want to be a bystander. I would like to be involved here. Okay, that actually leads us in really nicely to our next question from Tommy Rice, who's asked what changes you've incorporated into your life after the Kilimanjaro trip? Well, the first thing I did was wrestle with the question of, of how do I deal with this? So the big problem is carbon, carbon basically. That's, when it boils down to it, that's, that's probably our, our big problem. And I used to get on a jet 10 years ago and be like, yeah, I'm on a jet, you know, I'm going to have a glass of wine and go someplace cool. And now I, I think, do I really need this trip? Does something come out of this that's good? So I'm just conscious of it. And I don't have like, here are the top 10 things you need to do and we're done. I, I don't think that's realistic. The first question is, how do, we, how do we wrestle with it? How do we solve this problem? How do we engage with it? And just having that debate and questioning do we really need to fly somewhere? Do we really need a bigger house? What what do we need? And for me, the answers um, to those questions are, are not easy. I'm a hypocrite. I get on jets. All right. Flying is not a good thing to do. So but I do it. So how how do I mitigate that as best I can? Um, I first fly less. That's the best thing you can do. The second thing you can do is is use carbon offsets that are genuinely offsetting that um, carbon emission, not just temporarily sinking it, but actually genuinely making a difference. And um, then you can make changes in your political system. And this is where science should inform politics. And so vote for people who will make a change and do care about our environment and our planet. Um, that's that's got to happen. It's big system stuff. And then it gets smaller and smaller. You know, it, it helps to recycle. It helps to drive a far more fuel efficient vehicle and those are some changes I've made we have a, a very fuel efficient vehicle compared to what you know I've, I like monster trucks and stuff you know but <laughs> that is probably not the way forward so we don't need to drive those things all the time um, and then just smaller decisions you know it's I, I do I'm sort of an outdoors guy I like to hunt and I you know heat my house with renewable fuel wood for some of it anyhow so I got an electric chainsaw you know, it, it rips. I'm really stoked on this thing. It's like got the horsepower of my old gas saw and it's electric. And, and our grid is a lot of it's hydro based where I live. So it's, it's not too bad. There's some coal in there too. But um, so th those are and then eating less meat. You know, I'm a I'm a hunter, right? I am not um, a um, Zen sort of namaste new world person. <laughs> it's like, I mean, um, but we don't need to eat meat seven days a week here, right? And so for me, I'm a weekday vegetarian. I generally try not to eat meat during the week and um, on the weekends, okay, you know, I've, and by doing that, I've reduced my emissions quite substantially. And it's, it's easy at first. I was like, what do, I, what do I replace the meat with? You know, it's like, that's just how my mind works. It turns out it's, it isn't that hard actually. So things like that, and it's a very long answer to, the, to your question. So I'm sorry it took so long, but that's kind of how I think about it. Recognize the problem make big changes at a global and, and sort of national level and then do your best at the local level. But just going, hey, what can I do? How does it work? I think that's the real start of it for all of us. And I, th I think the fact that you've got a long answer speaks to the fact that it's actually, the tr no, the trip affected you and you've actually made some meaningful changes there. If, if it had been a really short answer, I bought an electric car, I'd have been like, Oh, okay, <laughs> but it's yeah having having that many changes at, at that many levels. Well, one of the other things that I've I've always looked at is that as consumers in a capitalist world, we can also mm -hmm. we can make that vote with the way we spend our money as well. If you're spending money with companies who are making responsible decisions about the climate and about their ethics, then yeah, you you're you're encouraging more businesses to move down that path. Yeah, and, and to dig into it as well, and these are these are complicated answers. Sometimes the obvious answer is not the right one. So you, you, you have to dig into it and understand it. And I, I, I hope that we can come together on this. I, I certainly, I think right now it's this very divided world where it's like, rah, rah, rah. It's like, well, no, we're all here together. And, and I don't want to yell at anybody. I just hope people 
look at these scenes and they had a huge impact on me. You know, they did drive real change. And my, I came back from Kilimanjaro and the kids were like, so dad, you know, like we're going to be eating vegetarian, huh? <laughs> it's like, and now they're stoked. They're like, it's veggie burger night. Yeah, believe it or not, they are stoked because they're really good. Yeah, they're, Sarah loves, she makes great veggie burgers. Kids love them. So, uh, you know, it, it is, I don't think it's a loss of quality of life with these changes. It's just, it's just, let's do things a bit differently. Think a bit more before we fly somewhere. Is this really necessary? You know, we all thought we had to fly everywhere six months ago, but in an odd way, COVID has proven that we can work from home. Maybe we don't need to do that. You didn't need to fly to Austria and neither did I to do this meeting. You know, it's working out and we can talk to people and people can talk to us. And I don't know, I just think that's cool. There's a couple of tons of carbon being saved. Um, we've got one last question here, another one from David Alter. Uh, he said, since you ice climb in very remote places, how much more careful are you since you and your crew are the only rescue you'll have in the event of an accident? Well, I think having some kind of rescue planning is very, very important. And uh, yeah, the answer is um, hopefully I'm aware of the outcome more when I'm in a very remote place. But just because we're close to rescue doesn't mean it's time to ignore the the kind of basic safety principles. You know, if a block of ice comes off and hits somebody, they aren't automatically safer because we're close to rescue. So I try to always operate with the best possible systems in terms of, you know, PPE, personal protective equipment, and again, understanding. Like safety comes down to understanding. How well do you understand the environment that you're operating in? And how, what's your goal? You know, if your goal is to be risky, go for it. I have zero issue with that. What I do is risky. And if that's where you want to operate, then go ahead. But like I'm all in, but I don't want to operate there very much. And when I'm with, you know, other people and they're relying on me and I'm relying on them, then I want things to be as safe as I can reasonably make them. And uh, sometimes that means running away. You know, we didn't get up. I can't tell everybody about it, but we changed our objectives in, in on Kilimanjaro um, based on it not being safe. So it doesn't matter if you're close to rescue or not. If it's not going to work out, please run away. <laughs> you, do, you, know, you can always come back. <laughs> it's a weird, well maybe not on Kilimanjaro well you can go back what you'll find might That's be quite true. different though. Um, but even then you know got... the goal is to live long and have have a good time you know and, and, and uh, no one climb is is worth you know cutting the game short we don't get another life like use it well wise wise words um we've got one last question from Sam Meister uh which projects do you have planned for 2021 well, the whole world just changed, and <laughs> a lot of the projects I have planned for 21, 2021, I don't know if other people, I bet other people out there are having the same experience, but you put a calendar up, and then you just wipe it, then you put a calendar up, and then you wipe it. <laughs> so what I'm doing for 2021 is, is focusing primarily on local um, events, and um, I've got some really exciting places to climb near my house. I've got a couple of potential research projects to help out with. And I'm just going to stay local and uh, focus on the things I can do. Um, I just figured out I might be able to get an electric snowmobile for this project I'm working on. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Like, you know, check that out and do amazing ice climbs. And this will be a good year for carbon for me. And uh, yeah, what can you do locally and explore your own place? That's where I'm at anyhow. And I still want to go back to Antarctica. And, and I've got a couple projects there I'd really like to do. They're just neat. But uh Stay local, do cool things locally, and stay stoked. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a brilliant place to end this. Thank you so, so much. I said at the beginning that you're a, an accomplished conversationalist, uh, and you've proved that and then some. That was a really, really entertaining chat. Well, thank you very much for your well-prepared questions, for getting up at three in the morning in New Zealand, and um, for everybody watching this, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the film. And, you know, thanks to Red Bull also for supporting this. There's many options and they chose to support this and appreciate it. So if you have any questions, you can always hit me up with an email or something too and happy to answer them that way. And just, yeah, thanks for tuning in.
Okay, so the last ascent can be found on Red Bull TV. Go and check it out. It is a very, very compelling watch, a brilliant documentary. Uh, you can also go and check out, if you haven't had enough of Will's action here, you can go and check out his YouTube channel. Well worth a watch. There's some lovely adventures down there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, there's plenty more climbing content as well on redbull.com if you want to go and check that out. Uh, for now, though, from both Will and I, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next time.